My name is Bob Pollack. I work on the economics of the family. I'm a professor at Washington University in St. Louis with an appointment in the economics department as well as the business school. Uh, and for the last probably 35 years, I've been working on various aspects of the economics of the family with models of bargaining in families. And most recently, thinking about uh, the implications of bargaining in families for equilibrium in marriage markets. Marriage markets being a metaphor that economists and other, social, other social scientists use to uh, think about who marries whom and who doesn't marry. I've always been interested more generally in social science issues, that I never was fully socialized into economics, I think. So my work has always drawn on other social sciences, uh, in particular, to some extent, on, uh, on psychology, but largely on sociology with the work on the family. Uh, one of the really formative experiences in my intellectual life was co-chairing a network that was sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation on the family and the economy. And it was an interdisciplinary network consisting of mostly economists, but with uh, three really excellent sociologists and two very excellent uh, developmental psychologists. And I learned an awful lot from them about the family. The standard model of the family in economics, which really goes back to the work of Gary Becker, is a model in which children are born to married parents who stay married as the children grow up and who invest in the children's human capital. And that was a model that, uh, that I used with Jerry Behrman and Paul Taubman in a book we published with the University of Chicago Press in 1995. And that was about the time the MacArthur Network started. And meeting four times a year with this group of developmental psychologists and sociologists, that view really became untenable. And the question in my mind was, how can you use the tools of economics to model what's going on in more complex families? And that really has been the focus of my more recent work, uh, more recent meaning since 1995, uh, work on bargaining in families, and as I said, more recently on equilibrium in the marriage market. The standard model in economics of equilibrium in the marriage market is a model that assumes that prospective spouses, when they meet in the marriage market, make binding agreements about how they'll divide things up after they're married. And it's a model that leads you to a really elegant mathematical formulation of how the marriage market works. And no one seems to have pursued seriously an alternative model in which you really can't settle much in the marriage market and allocation within marriage is determined by bargaining in marriage. And I've spent a lot of time elaborating models of bargaining in marriage and my most recent work is looking at the implications of bargaining in marriage for marriage market equilibrium. And it turns out to be a very different story in terms not only of how things are allocated within marriage, but in terms of who marries and who marries whom, and what economists call the Pareto efficiency of marriage market equilibrium. The assumption that people can make these binding agreements in the marriage market gives you some very strong results saying that uh, in the jargon of economics that marriage market equilibrium is Pareto efficient. And it turns out that if people bargain after they're married, that you need not get Pareto efficient outcomes. It is possible you will get Pareto efficient outcomes. Indeed, it's possible you'll get exactly the same outcomes you get from the standard model where people make binding agreements in the marriage market. But it's also possible that you'll get very different outcomes in terms of the number of marriages and who marries whom, as well as uh, allocation within marriage. Well, I've become much more interested recently uh, in the role of wealth, 
which we don't know nearly enough about. Economists have generally focused on income and on, uh, on parents' education, which are relatively easy things to, to measure. Uh, but I think a number of other social scientists are th starting to think much more seriously about the role of wealth. And we don't know nearly enough about wealth, either in how it plays out within families, but even in terms of total wealth, that our wealth data tends to be data on household wealth, which may make a great deal of sense for relatively stable households, but for relatively young people whose relationships may be unstable, one of the things that I would like to know as an economist, as a social scientist, is if they break up, who's going to walk away with what? Uh, who owns what in the marriage or the cohabiting relationship? Uh, what would be the cost of breaking up? And if all you have is household wealth, you have no clue about ownership rights to wealth if the household breaks up. And since we know from the work on bargaining in families that who controls income makes a lot of difference in terms of outcomes, it's a reasonable conjecture that who controls wealth ought to make a difference also. And yet our data really don't report that.